page 51. Life Against Death, Norman Oliver Brown, 1959. The Psychoanalytical Meaning of History. Part 1. The Problem. Chapter 2. Neurosis and History. The doctrine that all men are mad appears to conflict with a historical perspective on the nature and destiny of man, it appears to swallow all cultural variety, all historical change, into a darkness in which all cats are grey. But this objection neglects the richness and complexity of the Freudian theory of neurosis. In the first place there are several distinct kinds of neurosis, each with a different set of symptoms a different structure in the relations between the repressed, the ego, and reality. We are therefore in a position to return to the varieties and complexities of individual cultures if we entertain, as Freud does in Civilization and its Discontents, the hypothesis that the varieties of culture can be correlated with the varieties of neurosis, if the evolution of civilization has such a far-reaching similarity with the development of an individual and if the same methods are employed in both, would not the diagnosis be justified that many systems of civilization or epochs of it possibly even the whole of humanity have become neurotic under the pressure of civilizing trends? Two analytic dissection of these neuroses therapeutic recommendations might follow which could claim a great practical interest. And furthermore, it is a Freudian theorem that each individual neurosis is not static but dynamic. It is a historical process with its own internal logic. Because of the basically unsatisfactory nature of the neurotic compromise, tension between the repressed and repressing factors persists and produces a constant series of new symptom formations. And the series of symptom formations is not a shapeless series of mere changes it exhibits a regressive pattern, which Freud calls the slow return of the repressed. It is a law of neurotic diseases, he says, that these obsessive acts increasingly come closer to the original impulse and to the original forbidden act itself. The doctrine of the universal neurosis of mankind, if we take it seriously, therefore compels us to entertain the hypothesis that the pattern of history exhibits a dialectic not hitherto recognized by historians, the dialectic of neurosis. A reinterpretation of human history is not an appendage to psychoanalysis but an integral part of it. The empirical fact which compelled Freud to comprehend the whole of human history in the area of psychoanalysis is the appearance in dreams and in neurotic symptoms of themes substantially identical with major themes both ritualistic and mythical in the religious history of mankind. The link between the theory of neurosis and the theory of history is the theory of religion, as is made perfectly clear in Totem and Taboo and Moses and Monotheism. And the link affects both ends linked. Freud not only maintains that human history can be understood only as a neurosis but also that the neuroses of individuals can be understood only in the context of human history as a whole. From the time when he wrote Totem and Taboo, 1913, Freud says in Moses and Monotheism, 1937, I have never doubted that religious phenomena are to be understood only on the model of the neurotic symptoms of the individual. According to the analogy elaborated in Moses and Monotheism, in the history of the species something happened similar to the events in the life of the individual. That is to say, Mankind as a whole passed through conflicts of a sexual aggressive nature, which left permanent traces, but which were for the most part hoarded off and forgotten later, after a long period of latency, they came to life again and created phenomena similar in structure and tendency to neurotic symptoms. This analogy supplies Freud with his notion of the archaic heritage mankind is a prisoner of the past in the same sense as our hysterical patients are suffering from reminiscences and neurotics cannot escape from the past. Thus the bondage of all cultures to their cultural heritage is a neurotic constriction. And conversely, Freud came to recognize that the core of the neuroses of individuals lay in the same archaic heritage memory traces of the experiences of former generations, which can only be understood phylogenetically. 
The repressed unconscious which produces neurosis is not an individual unconscious but a collective one. Freud abstains from adopting Jung's term but says, the content of the unconscious is collective anyhow. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, each individual recapitulates the history of the race. In the few years of childhood we have to cover the enormous distance of development from primitive man of the Stone Age to civilized man of today. From this it follows that the theory of neurosis must embrace a theory of history and conversely a theory of history must embrace a theory of neurosis. Psychoanalysis must view religion both as neurosis and as that attempt to become conscious and to cure, inside the neurosis itself, on which Freud came at the end of his life to pin his hopes for therapy. Psychoanalysis is vulgarly interpreted as dismissing religion as an erroneous system of wishful thinking. In The Future of an Illusion, Freud does speak of religion as a substitute gratification the Freudian analog to the Marxian formula, opiate of the people. But according to the whole doctrine of repression, substitute gratification is a term which applies not only to poetry and religion but also to dreams and neurotic symptoms contain truth, they are expressions, distorted by repression, of the immortal desires of the human heart. The proper psychoanalytical perspective on religion is that taken in Moses and monotheism, where Freud set out to find the fragment of historic and psychological truth in Judaism and Christianity. Even Marx in the same passage in which the notorious formula opiate of the people occurs speaks of religion as the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world. But Marx, lacking the concept of repression and the unconscious that is to say, not being prepared to recognize the mystery of the human heart could not pursue the line of thought implied in his own epigram. Psychoanalysis is equipped to study the mystery of the human heart, and must recognize religion to be the heart of the mystery. But psychoanalysis can go beyond religion only if it sees itself as completing what religion tries to do, namely, make the unconscious conscious then psychoanalysis would be the science of original sin. Psychoanalysis is in a position to define the error in religion only after it has recognized the truth. It is not to be denied that Freud's earlier writings, especially Totem and Taboo, contain, besides much that looks forward to Moses and monotheism, another line of thought on the relation between psychoanalysis and history. This other line of thought works out the notion that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny in a different way. The psychoanalytical model for understanding history is not neurosis but the process of growing up or rather, maturity is envisaged not as a return of the repressed infantile neurosis but as the overcoming of it. In effect, Freud correlates his own psychosexual stages of the individual with the stages of the history postulated by 19th century evolutionary minded thinkers of the type of Compton Fraser. Thus in Totem and Taboo he says that the animistic phase corresponds to narcissism, in both time and substance the religious phase corresponds to the stage of object finding in which dependence on the parents is paramount while the scientific phase corresponds to maturity, in which the individual, who by now has renounced the pleasure principle and has accepted reality, seeks his object in the outer world. This line of thought is a residue of 18th century optimism and rationalism in Freud in that history is not a process of becoming sicker but a process of becoming wiser. The early Freud if we forget the later Freud thus justifies the quite naive and traditionalist view of history held by most psychoanalysts. But this line of thought is not simply inadequate as history it is inadequate as psychoanalysis. It belongs with Freud's early system of psychoanalysis, with his early theory of the instincts, and with his early, and traditionalist, theory of the human ego. It is true that the implementation of the approach to history adumbrated in Freud's later writings involves great difficulties. Freud himself, in the passage suggesting a correlation between cultures and neurosis, put his finger on the heart of the problem when he pointed out the need to develop a concept of a normal or healthy culture by which to measure the neurotic cultures recorded by history. 
From the point of view taken in this book, the development of such a concept is the central problem confronting both psychoanalysis and history. And the lack of such a concept explains the failure of both historians and psychoanalysts, with the exception of R. A. Tilde Kugheim, to pursue Freud's pioneering efforts. But if historians have failed to follow Freud, poets have characteristically anticipated him. Is there not, for example, a still unexplored truth in the statement of the German poet Hebel, is it so hard to recognize that the German nation has up till now no life history to show for itself, but only the history of a disease? And not just the German nation which is or used to be the scapegoat carrying all the sins of the Western world. According to James Joyce, history is a nightmare from which I am trying to awaken. The Poets and Nietzsche Nietzsche's genealogy of morals is the first attempt to grasp world history as the history of an ever-increasing neurosis. And both Nietzsche and Freud find the same dynamic in the neurosis of history, an ever-increasing sense of guilt caused by repression. Nietzsche's climax too long has the world been a madhouse compares with the dark conclusion of civilization and its discontents. If civilization is an inevitable course of development from the group of the family to the group of humanity as a whole, then an intensification of the sense of guilt will be inextricably bound up with it, until perhaps the sense of guilt may swell to a magnitude that individuals can hardly support. The necessity of a psychoanalytical approach to history is pressed upon the historian by one question, why does man, alone of all animals, have a history? For man is distinguished from animals not simply by the possession and transmission from generation to generation of that superbiological apparatus which is culture, but also, if history and changes in time are essential characteristics of human culture and therefore of man, by a desire to change his culture and so to change himself. In making history man makes himself, to use the suggestive title of Gordon Child's book. Then the historical process is sustained by man's desire to become other than what he is. And man's desire to become something different is essentially an unconscious desire. The actual changes in history neither result from nor correspond to the conscious desires of the human agents who bring them about. Every historian knows this, and the philosopher of history, Hegel, in his Doctrine of the Cunning of Reason, made it a fundamental point in his structural analysis of history. Mankind today is still making history without having any conscious idea of what it really wants or under what conditions it would stop being unhappy in fact what it is doing seems to be making itself more unhappy and calling that unhappiness progress. Christian theology, or at least Augustinian theology, recognizes human restlessness and discontent the core irrequitum, as the psychological source of the historical process. But Christian theology, to account for the origin of human discontent and to indicate a solution, has to take man out of this real world, out of the animal kingdom, and inculcate into him delusions of grandeur. And thus Christian theology commits its own worst sin, the sin of pride. Freud's real critique of religion and the future of an illusion is the contention, also Spinoza's, that true humility lies in science. True humility, he says, requires that we learn from Copernicus that the human world is not the purpose or the center of the universe that we learn from Darwin that man is a member of the animal kingdom and that we learn from Freud that the human ego is not even master in its own house. Apart from psychoanalysis there are no secular or scientific theories as to why man is the restless and discontented animal. The discontented animal is the neurotic animal, the animal with desires given in his nature which are not satisfied by culture. From the psychoanalytical point of view, these unsatisfied and repressed but immortal desires sustain the historical process. History is shaped beyond our conscious wills, not by the cunning of reason but by the cunning of desire. The riddle of history is not in reason but in desire not in labor, but in love. A confrontation with Marx will clarify Freud. 
It is axiomatic in Marxism to define the essence of man as labor. Freud has no quarrel with the Marxist emphasis on the importance of the economic factor in history. He formally praises Marxism for its clear insight into the determining influence which is exerted by the economic conditions of man upon his intellectual, ethical, and artistic reactions. For Freud, work and economic necessity are the essence of the reality principle, but the essence of man lies not in the reality principle but in repressed unconscious desires. No matter how stringently economic necessities press down on him, he is not in his essence homo economicus or homo laborans no matter how bitter the struggle for bread, man does not live by bread alone. Thus Freud becomes irrelevant when history raises this question, what does man want over and beyond economic welfare and mastery over nature? Marx defines the essence of man as labor and traces the dialectic of labor in history till labor abolishes itself. There is then a vacuum in the Marxist utopia. Unless there is no utopia, unless history is never abolished, unless labor continues to be, like Faust, driven to ever greater achievements, some other and truer definition of the essence of man must be found. Freud suggests that beyond labor there is love. And if beyond labor at the end of history there is love, Love must have always been there from the beginning of history, and it must have been the hidden force supplying the energy devoted to labor and to making history. From this point of view, repressed eros is the energy of history and labor must be seen as sublimated eros. In this way a problem not faced by Marx can be faced with the aid of Freud. Marxism is a system of sociology the importance of the economic factor is a sociological question to be settled by sociologists Freud himself, speaking as a sociologist, can say that an imposing repression at bottom society's motive is economic. The quarrel between psychoanalysis and economic determinism arises in the tacit psychological assumptions behind economic determinism and therefore arises only when we pass from sociology to psychology, from the abstraction of society to the concrete human individual. The issue is not the importance of economics but its psychology. Marx himself, though always complicated, is not free from the tacit assumption, held generally by economic determinists, that the concrete human needs and drives sustaining economic activity are just what they appear to be and are fully in consciousness, self-preservation and pleasure, as understood by the utilitarians, summarize the psychological theory implied by the ingenuous invocation of categories like economic necessity and human needs. But the proof that human needs are not what they seem to be lies precisely in the fact of human history. The Faustian restlessness of man in history shows that men are not satisfied by the satisfaction of their conscious desires men are unconscious of their real desires. Thus a psychology of history must be psychoanalytical. Insofar as Marx faced this question at all, lacking the concept of repressed unconscious desires he could only come up with a psychology of history which condemns man to be eternally Faustian and precludes any possibility of happiness. Marx needs a psychological premise to explain the unceasing bent for technological progress sustaining the dialectic of labor in history. Lacking the doctrine of repression or rather not being able to see man as a psychological riddle Marx, as a sympathetic critic has shown, comes to biology and postulates an absolute law of human biology that the satisfaction of human needs always generates new needs. If human discontent is thus biologically given, it is incurable. Quite specifically, not only the abolition of history but also an economy of abundance, as envisioned in Marx's utopian phase, are out of the question. Hence the dark clouds of pessimism in the third volume of Capital, where he says, Just as the savage must wrestle with nature, in order to satisfy his wants, in order to maintain his life and to reproduce it, so the civilized man has to do it in all forms of society and under all modes of production. With his development the realm of natural necessity expands, 
because his wants increase but at the same time the forces of production increase, by which these wants are satisfied. But Marx's assumption of a biological basis for progress in history really amounts to a confession that he is unable to explain it psychologically. Psychoanalysis can provide a theory of progress, but only by viewing history as a neurosis. By defining man as the neurotic animal, psychoanalysis not merely assumes man's Faustian character but also explains why man is so. To quote Freud, what appears as an untiring impulsion toward further perfection can easily be understood as a result of the instinctual repression upon which is based all that is most precious in human civilization. The repressed instinct never ceases to strive for complete satisfaction, which would consist in the repetition of a primary experience of satisfaction. No substitutive or reactive formations and no sublimations will suffice to remove the repressed instinct's persisting tension. By the same token, psychoanalysis offers a theoretical framework for exploring the possibility of a way out of the nightmare of endless progress and endless Faustian discontent, a way out of the human neurosis, a way out of history. In the case of the neurotic individual, the goal of psychoanalytical therapy is to free him from the burden of his past, from the burden of his history, the burden which compels him to go on having, and being, a case history. And the method of psychoanalytical therapy is to deepen the historical consciousness of the individual, fill up the memory gaps, till he awakens from his own history as from a nightmare. Psychoanalytical Consciousness as a higher stage in the general consciousness of mankind, may be likewise the fulfillment of the historical consciousness, that ever-widening and deepening search for origins which has obsessed Western thought ever since the Renaissance. If historical consciousness is finally transformed into psychoanalytical consciousness, the grip of the dead hand of the past on life and the present would be loosened, and man would be ready to live instead of making history to enjoy instead of paying back old scores and debts, and to enter that state of being which was the goal of his becoming. Page 69